Well, I believe that the prophetic ministry is one of the most powerful ministries in the earth today. Hello, I'm David Diga Hernandez, and you are watching ETV Interviews here on the Encounter TV Network. And on this edition of ETV Interviews, I have with me a very good friend, and I want to tell you about him just for a minute here. You know, I've grown up in church. I'm 29 at the time we record this. I'm a pastor's kid, third generation preacher, fourth generation Christian. I've seen many evangelists come through, many prophets come through, but I have never personally known a prophetic gift as strong or as anointed as the prophetic gift on this man's life. And I'm telling you, you're going to be really encouraged and you're going to be stirred today as we talk to Prophet Robert Sanchez. And what I want him to do, if the Lord leads him, at the end of this broadcast, I want him to begin to give words of knowledge to those who are watching. So I want you to let your faith come alive. Yes. And I want you to expect a touch of God as we welcome my guest, Prophet Robert Sanchez. Thank you, my friend, for being on here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I think of all the people I've ever had on my program, you're the most frequent guest. And I know the <laughs> ETV audience loves you. And so, you know, I just want to jump right into this. You know, we know about your ministry, your prophetic, and for those of you who don't, you're about to find out. Just whet our appetite for the prophetic here by giving us, just tell me a story about a time that God spoke to you and a prophetic word was delivered. I was in Southern California and I was ministering. And I remember getting a word of knowledge and I started ministering to a specific lady saying, I see God sending you to houses where women are being abused. I see guns, I see knives, I see violence, I see danger, and God's gonna send you in there to rescue these women. And I'm, I'm prophesying over her, she's weeping and crying, and all of a sudden the Lord speaks to me and says, look there behind you. And so I look behind me and the word of the Lord jumps out of my mouth and I said, you're the woman. You're the woman that she rescued last night. You're the woman that she went into a house filled with guns and knives and violence and set free. And I began to prophesy to the second lady how God was used this other lady to set her free. And at that very moment, I hear the word of the Lord from the heavens. And I literally heard these words come out of God's mouth. Tell her she is forgiven. And immediately when I heard the Lord say, she is forgiven, I saw three babies in heaven, two boys and a little girl. And I began to prophesy to this young lady. And I said, the Lord wants to let you know that your life is about to get on track. You're about to move forward and you're about to be healed and set free. By the way, there's three babies in heaven that say, mama, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And she begins to weep on the floor profusely. And she grabs me and she says, prophet, you had no idea. And she says, I've been, she said, I, I have seven children, but she says, I've been raped countless times. And she says, and three times out of being raped, I gave, I was pregnant and I gave all of those up in abortion. And I, and as you're saying, I'm forgiven. She says, I've always wept and cried. She said, I'm a believer. I knew better. But she said, I just couldn't live with the pain. And she said, but I couldn't move forward because I always lived in guilt. So the word of the Lord that came out of the heavens, Mama, you're forgiven, totally set this woman free. She grabbed me. She embraced me. And she said, I've met many prophets, but I've never met one that had the ability to hear what heaven is saying and see what heaven is doing and relay it to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to me on the earth. Can you imagine being in her position, though? I mean, to go into a church service, I could imagine that if she's sitting in that church service, she's probably overwhelmed with guilt and shame and probably had been for years. Absolutely. And that was her story. She said, she said, I've wanted to do right. And she said, and I've wanted to leave these abusive relationships. I've wanted to leave these drug infested houses, but I couldn't. She said, because I felt like God didn't love me because of what I'd done. And so when that word of forgiveness from the heavens came, and I literally said, I see two boys and one little girl saying, Mama, you're forgiven. At that very moment, she just wept and cried. And she said, you have no idea how God has used you to free me today. It's life changing. Absolutely. In a moment. And that's the, that's the power of the prophetic is it gets people unstuck. And there's a word that's on your heart that I believe is going to help people get unstuck. Can you get into that word? Absolutely. One of the things that I really believe that God is doing in this hour is he wants to break us through. But he don't just want us to break through. He wants us to stay through. 
And today, if I can, I want to share a simple thought called Behind the Armor. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a story of a man of the name of Naaman. He's a commander of the Syrian army. God had given him great victories in Israel. And the Bible gives all of these great accolades, but the Bible says he's a leper. And so to truly understand what God is saying in this hour, we got to learn to shed our garments. We got to learn to get rid of some of the things that we're hiding behind. And Naaman could very easily hide behind being a commander, being a leader, being a, a man of, of rank and authority. But when he went home, he was a leper. And the Bible says something very interesting. It says that when Naaman went out on a raid, he brought back a young girl that was captive from the land of Israel, and she became a servant to his wife. I find it interesting that God always finds someone and puts them in a position where it looks bad, but God is going to use them for the good. Maybe some of you here might be watching and you've been going through some bad things and you only see bad in the midst of everything that's happening, but could it be that God is positioning you to be the voice of breakthrough for somebody else? Mm -hmm. And so this young girl, she was taken against her will. She was taken from her family, from her culture, from her, from her, from her comforts, from her joys and from everything that was familiar to her, put in an environment, now she's a slave. She went from being free to being a servant too. And she was afforded a supernatural ability. And this is what I mean. She didn't just get to see Naaman dressed up in his armor because she was tending to Naaman's wife. She got to see him when he took the armor off. Everybody else got to see him as a commander and a leader and a mighty man of valor but she got to see him with his armor off as a man with leprosy and with a spot. I said all that to say this, many times we all have an issue that we like to hide behind. We have things that we allow to cover and to kind of mask the truth that's in us. You could take that all the way to the garden. You could look at Adam. When Adam ate from the tree, What's the first thing he went and did? Covered himself. He went and covered himself in fig leaves. And today there is a whole lot of people that are still covering themselves in yesterday's pain because living in that pain, there's a strength in it. There are some people that are, like to be boisterous and loud and strong and uh, use their <clears throat> intimidation to get what they want. But the truth behind that man that's raising his voice, there's a broken, shattered young man that was probably wounded or abused somewhere in his life. But as long as he don't let nobody know that he was wounded and he just holds this uh, personification of his strength, everyone's going to think he's a great, strong man. And so sometimes God will put you in a position like he did this young captive girl, not only to see a man for his strength, but also to have the ability to view him in his weakness. But when she saw him in his weakness, she didn't expose it. She didn't bring it out and go and tell the world. You know, many times when somebody recognizes a man of God has an issue, a blemish, a spot, uh, a fault, you know, they, they charismatically like to say, well, Lord, help us pray for our dear brother because they're going through something in their marriage or in their family. And, and they kind of not saying it, but let everybody know that you need special prayer because of this blemish. Gossip disguised as a prayer request. Exactly. And what does this young woman do? She, though she was taken out of her comfort zone, she had a word of encouragement in her mouth. And she says these words to the mistress. She said, if my master knew the prophet who was in Israel, he would heal him of his leprosy. That word, that prophetic word that came out of a no-name servant prophet of God was so powerful, it rang and registered so deeply in Naaman's wife, she couldn't keep silent. So you know what she did? She told Naaman. That word of hope so inspired, so encouraged him that there is a day beyond his issue that he went and told the king. The king was so excited for his servant, for his commander, that he said, I'm going to write a letter and I'm going to send it to the king of Israel that he might heal you of leprosy. I'm going to send you with silver and gold and changes of clothing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you with everything that you need to go and get this. So when they send a letter to the king of Israel, the king of Israel gets this letter and what does he say? He says, who is this man that seeks to quarrel with me? 
who is he th what does he think? That I'm a God that I can heal and make alive? And he, he tears his garment and he goes into mourning. And what does the prophet do? The prophet sends messenger to the king and says, send him to me that he might know that there's a prophet in Israel who could heal him of his leprosy. Hmm. And so what happens is Naaman now is rerouted to the prophet Elijah's house. And so many times we think we have God figured out. We know what God's going to do next. So Naaman now knows he's going to the right place where the man that carries the presence of God and has the ability to heal him, the king has sent him to the exact location. So when the name and the commander gets to the prophet's house, he knocks on the door and he's dressed in his armor. He's dressed, noticed and recognizable for the great man of valor that he is. The prophet Elijah don't even answer the door. He sends a servant to answer the door and the servant opens the door and says, the prophet Elijah says, go dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan and you'll be healed. At that very moment, he shuts the door. His message is done. And now Naaman, who's come all this way to find his breakthrough, to find his healing, find his deliverance, what happens? He becomes enraged. He becomes furious. And he begins to leave in this irate manner. And right then something happens. A no-name servant opens his mouth and says, Master, if the prophet asked you to do something valiant, would you have not done it? If he asked you to do something bold and courageous, something that would glorify the armor that you wear and minister to the, the ego that you have, would you not have done it? He said, absolutely. He says, but how simple of a matter is, he said, go dip seven times in the Jordan and be healed. And then he reveals something. He says, are not the rivers of Damascus and the Pfeiffer rivers far greater than the waters of Israel? See, he had a problem and his problem was what? The waters of Israel. But he doesn't know what Joshua chapter 3, verse 13, portion C says. And it says, And the Lord God of Israel rested in the waters of the Jordan. Wow. When you study the name Jordan, it means descender, to go down one way, come up another. Jesus himself was going to be baptized in the Jordan, a man who knew no sin. But when he came up, what happened? The heavens opened. I'm here to tell someone watching tonight that you felt like you've lived under a closed heaven. But since the book of Matthew, the third chapter, when Jesus went down in the river Jordan and came up, the heavens opened. Never again do you ever see that there is a closed heaven. We live under a perpetual open heaven. Breakthrough is not something we have to search for, something we have to believe for. Breakthrough is in your hands. Remember when Moses comes to uh, the Red Sea and he's looking around for a resource because the people are murmuring because the Israeli army, or excuse me, the Egyptian army is behind them and there's a Red Sea before them. And what does God tell Moses to do? He says, don't pray. He says, lift up your hand and stretch out your rod. I'm here to tell you that sometimes we are always looking for resources to come from our left hand or our right. We're looking before us or behind us, but sometimes we just need to look in our hand. And the very thing that God's placed in our hands, like he placed in Moses, the staff to lead, when he lifted it up and stretched it out, guess what happened? Breakthrough. The Red Sea parted. I'm here to let Many people, as I can, know that your breakthrough is just waiting for you to stretch out. You realize that Jesus himself stretched out on a cross called Calvary, and then he experienced death for three days and three nights, but then when he got up, he brought forth resurrection life. And we live in that place of resurrection life. So I believe that sick, bo sick bodies can be healed. I believe that uh, minds that are tormented can be set free. I believe that broken hearts can be healed. Marriages can be restored. Families be renewed. I, I believe that if we serve this God, he's the God of breakthrough. Going back to Naaman, Naaman didn't know that God was resting in the waters of Israel, but this was Naaman's problem. Nobody else knew he was a leper. His king knew, his wife knew, this little lep, uh, this young captive girl knew that he was a leper and she offered a word of hope. Now that hope took him to the door of the prophet, but his mind said, surely the prophet's gonna come out, wave his hand over my leprosy and I'm gonna be healed. He had already figured out how God was gonna do it because of his rank, because of his honor, because of who he was. But when God doesn't meet our needs the way we think he should, we often find ourselves what? Frustrated in man. But here's the truth that I discovered. 
Naaman wouldn't have mind dipping in the rivers of Damascus. And the reason why was because that was his community. For him to dip, he couldn't go and dip in his armor because his armor was made out of bronze. He had a coat of mail. He had a sword. You, I don't know if you go and try and take a, a dip in a, in a river loaded down with, with a heavy armor, guess what's going to happen? You might go down and not come back up. <laughs> so when he was being sent to go dip in the river Jordan, he didn't know that the God of Israel was resting in that very place. The Bible says a little later in that scripture in the book of Joshua that when the soles of the feet of the priest stepped into that water, that it stood up. It stood up at a place called Adam. Adam speaks of the old nature. That's what this man, Naaman, was covered in. He was covered in an old nature. He was covered in old ways. But God caused that river, when the priest's feet stood in, uh, stepped into it, he caused it to stand up all the way to the Dead Sea at a heap. And the Bible says there was a city beside it called Zaratan. Zarathan is an amazing city because when you study it out in Hebrew, you know what it means? It means to puncture or to break through. I'm here to tell you that God will always cause you to experience your Zarathan, your Zarathan, your breakthrough, when you're willing to get rid of the thing that you've been hidden behind. When God came looking for Adam in the cool of the day, he said, Adam, where are you? Adam says, what? I'm hiding. He was hiding, not just physically, but he was spiritually hiding in what? Fig leaves. He was hiding in what he went and clothed himself in. When the Lord came looking for him in the cool of the day, the Lord said, Adam, where are you? Greater translation is, Adam, who have you become? Hmm. Because I didn't make you this way. I didn't make you to be ashamed. I didn't make you to be fearful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so, of course, when he asks him the simple question, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? His first thing is deflection. The woman thou hast given me has made me eat. So many times we don't ever want to reveal that we have an issue. So we deflect. We point the finger. We point blame. Naaman was no different. He is in this place where he has to go into the rivers of the Jordan in an unfamiliar territory where nobody knows that he has this leprosy behind the armor. But what does God do? He makes him take it off. You know what I discovered in Mark chapter 10? Humanity will put something on a man, label him, and that mark will live with him. Maybe you grew up in a house where your father said, you're a loser, you're a good for nothing. And so you grew up in the mindset, well, I can't accomplish anything. My goals aren't important. You know, maybe you grew up in a household where you were shh and you were told your voice is insignificant. And every time you try to speak out, somebody put their finger to you and said, shh. And so now you have a problem opening your mouth. And so you just live in constant chaos and frustration because of this. In the book of Mark, the 10th chapter, there's a story of a man by the name of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was blind. When you study his name, Bar Timaeus, Bar means the son of, Timaeus means the foul. Uh, crooked or ashamed. So here is a man that's blind and humanity has put a garment on him that, that labels him insignificant. But when he heard that Jesus was walking by, what did he do? He lifted up his voice mm -hmm. and he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. He cried out with everything in him. He was blind, but he wasn't deaf. He understood that there was a man that had the power to heal him. He had heard of the great miracles, the signs and the wonders. And he thought, man, this might be my only opportunity to get this garment, this label that's been placed off of me, off of me, that I can get out of darkness that I could truly see. And so what does he do? He begins to cry out all the more. And what happens? The system of religion meets him and says, shh, you're going to be a disturbance to the master, the teacher. But he didn't listen to those words voices. He didn't listen to the shush anymore. He broke out of it. And the Bible says, and Jesus stood still and called him. I love that word right there, to stand still. The word still in there in the Greek means in covenant between heaven and earth. When Jesus stood still between the covenant of heaven and earth, you know what he did? He spoke and he called for that very man. The same system that said, shh, your voice is ir irrelevant. You're a disturbance. You know what that, those voices said? Here, let me take you to the master. He's calling you. But Bartimaeus stood up and did something. He took off that garment of, that he was labeled with, that he was hidden behind all these years, and he does something. He takes it and he casts it to the side. I'm here to tell you, those of you that are watching today, that this is your season to break through and stay through. 
This is your Zarathan moment, but you got to take some things that don't fit you off of you. When you take those things off and you cast it to the side, suddenly a blind man can see. We can look at it in another portion of scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 through 40. David is standing before Saul telling him his servant will go and fight. Saul tries to talk him out of it, but there was no talking David out of it. He says, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. What's the next thing that Saul does? He says, go and the Lord go with you or the Lord be with you. And then he says, but by the way, put on my what? Armor. Armor. There is always a system that always wants to put theirs on you. They want to mark you. They want to label you. They want to call you their own. I find it very interesting that the armor that wasn't good enough for Saul to go to battle in, (laughs) suddenly that armor is good enough to put on David and send David into the battle. And you know what I come to realize? Saul wasn't willing to go and fight, but he wanted all of Israel to think that he was him in the battle because a king's armor is different than his soldiers. So Saul wanted David to have the appearance that he was the king. It was King Saul, that it was him. But David put all this stuff on, and what does he say? This armor is not proven. It's not been tested. I cannot walk in these. If you're struggling in your spiritual walk, maybe it's because somebody has put something on you that you're not meant to carry. Maybe A system of religion has put a garment on you, a label, a mark. They've called you theirs when you're God's. And it's hard to walk in. It's hard to function. So what does David do? He said, these are not proven. And he does something. The Bible says, and he took it off. I'm here to tell you that David had the same revelation that Bartimaeus had. This is not who I am. I'm greater than this. I'm going to go ahead and shed this. If we relate the very next story found in 1 Samuel chapter 18, it's the story of Jonathan, whose name means the gift of God. Jonathan was the son of Saul. He was the next king of Israel. He was going to be the next leader, the one that would supersede his father. But the Bible says that Jonathan's soul was knit to David, and he loved him as his own. And you know what Jonathan does? The gift of God. He takes off his garments, his sword, his armor, He takes off his garment, and what does he do? He gives it to David. I believe that Jonathan had a revelation. This is the next appointed man. I'm going to serve behind him. Though by inheritance I should be the next king of Israel, he says, I recognize God's favor, and so I'm going to live out the fullness of my name. My name means the gift of God. I'm going to gift him what he's called to be, and Jonathan took it off. I'm just simply here to say this. When Naaman got to the place where the servant told him, Master, if he asks you to do something valiant, will you do it? Yes. Then do something simple. Dip and be clean. Who cares if somebody recognizes you have a fault or a shortcoming, you have a spot or a wrinkle, that you're not perfect. But if you take off the armor that you're hiding behind, that imperfection has the right to be healed. You know what Naaman does? He goes to the River Jordan, Brother David, and you know what he does? He takes off his armor. The moment he takes it off and dips, the Bible says his flesh was restored like a baby skin. I'm just simply here to tell you, those that are watching, maybe the Lord has been prompting you to shed some things like fear, anxiety, depression, hatred, bitterness, anger. It's time to let go of the things that you hide behind. Some people, they hide behind their talents, their gifts. If you're a great musician, sometimes it's easy to hide behind a keyboard or a guitar. You know, if if you're a, a fearful man, it's easy to hide behind being tough and strong and a man of rage to get what you want. We hide behind many different things. Some people hide behind words like, hey, how are you today? All is well, but yet their heart is crushed. We hide behind so many different things. These are the fig leaves that God wants And he gave his life so that we don't have to be clothed in that shame or that guilt or that condemnation. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Most people don't understand that the meaning of the word for world in Greek is cosmos. It's the root word for cosmetics, which does nothing more than cover a man up. Humanity has learned to live 
in the cosmos, the state of the age, in a world where we cover everything up. Every blemish covered behind makeup. Every insecurity covered behind armor. But you know what God's looking for? He's looking for us to become a Jonathan, a gift of God, to take it off. He's looking for us to become a Bartimaeus. Yeah, maybe we might have been identified as the son of the fowl. But you know what? When we take off that garment, we don't have to live in that stigma anymore. We can live healed. We can truly become like a David and recognize this thing don't fit. Strip it off and go and slay our giants with the very weaponry that God's placed in our hand. That is a powerful word you're ministering. And there are people watching right now I know who are covered and they, they're carrying those things that are keeping them from their breakthrough. But I want you just to, for the next couple of minutes, as the Lord leads you, look right into that camera and speak prophetically to the ones watching. Yeah, the first name that came to me was the name Reuben. The name Reuben, Reuben was the son of a man of God that went up and defiled his father's house. And so Reuben's prophetic word was, you shall not excel and you shall be unstable as water. And there's somebody watching that has felt like your life is unstable like water. And your father said you would never excel. But I hear the word of the Lord to you, Reuben, and it is this. For I, the Lord, have touched you and you're no longer unstable. But I've taken away your double-mindedness. I've taken away your fear and I heal you of your insecurity and I make you whole. I remove the garments that others have placed on you, that have limited you. And I say unto you today, if you would cast them to the side like Bartimaeus, he said, I will clothe you in righteousness and I will cause you to excel in what you touch. And I literally sense that God is breaking your heart free from the shackles that you feel like you can't breathe. And even in relationships, you seem to push those that you love away. And instead of drawing close to your family, you simply want to draw uh, or you want to dwell alone. But I heard the Lord say your cave season is over and it's your day to break through. For I have pierced that old way and brought you into a new day. And so I release that word into your life right here, right now in Jesus name. I send that word to Reuben. I also sense that there is somebody that's been dealing with migraine headaches and You've gone to the doctors and they haven't been able to help you. You've tried remedies. The only thing that seems to work is when you get into a dark room and you sit still and you can't move, but you can't live life that way. I heard the Lord say, today I am breaking these cluster headaches. They come in clusters. And he says, and I'm destroying them. And he says, and I'm gonna give you the power to open your mouth and declare a new thing. And the Lord says, speak to the mountain and it will be removed. I know you have been praying, but now the Lord says, I am going to give you the power of a decree. Most people don't realize that a decree is the highest form of prayer. And I believe that God is going to cause you to begin to decree a thing so he could establish it. And I heard the Lord say, I declare that you will become a voice that will not tolerate this infirmity within your mind and in your head. And God says, speak to the mountain and I'm removing it. I'm destroying it and I'm healing you even now. But even as I heal you, I'm giving you the power to use the words that I've placed in your mouth as a voice in the kingdom. I really believe that this individual that I'm speaking to, you have a strong prophetic call. And there was a time where you had many dreams and many visions, but because of these headaches, you can't even think. And the enemy knew that as, as long as you couldn't focus, you couldn't be used. But God says, he, he may have tried to interrupt your dreams, but he could never take away the power of, of your voice and my voice that flows to you. He said, speak it and watch me bring it. Your dreams will come back and great will be the word of hope that you'll release and inspire into my people, says the Spirit of the Lord. There's a couple more minutes if you, if the Lord leads you with more names or, or people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, just sitting here, I could feel the presence of God and I could feel this weighty, heavy presence that's just sitting here. And I could feel God's love being sent forth. I really believe that I just saw a baby that was having seizures and his eyes roll back. It's a little boy. His eyes roll back. He's very light in complexion. I want to say like a light brown to blondish hair with very light colored eyes. And his mother is watching. And I really believe that what God is saying is I've heard your cry. 
because you, you gave birth expecting a healthy son and suddenly you've been met with this, you know, in your mind, this tragedy and your great desire is to see your son set free. I heard the Lord say that I'm gonna calm the seizures and I'm gonna cause the inflammation that's been in his, in his brain uh, to begin to, to decrease and I'm gonna cause the seizures that have been interrupting his sleep and causing you fear and worry and chaos to suddenly be swallowed up by the love of God. So Father, I curse these very seizures. I curse this very sickness that's come to this young child. This baby can't be more than six months old. And I declare that the mother's prayers have been heard and the Lord is sending answers. It's a day of release. It's a day of healing. It's your set time for a miracle. It's your day of breakthrough. The Lord says, do not live in fear. Live in the word that I've given you that victory has come. It is your day for breakthrough says the Spirit of the Lord. Now, even if Prophet Rob didn't call you out specifically, that word he shared on Naaman and stripping himself of the things that keep him from his breakthrough was a powerful word, and I want you to receive that. But if you'd like to hear more from Prophet Rob's ministry, okay, how do we get a hold of you? Where, where, where do we go? To you could go to prophetrobsanchez.com, uh, and we have everything listed there. Our books, we have uh, three different devotionals that we have. And there are three, there are two of them are 365 day devotionals and they all have a prophetic word at the end. Uh, we also have one that's a 30 day devotional challenge and that devotional is to cultivate a lifestyle of worship. Most people wanna know how to prophesy. I'll tell you this, you can't prophesy without reading the word because the word is prophetic, but understanding that God has given you a metron. The greater your knowledge of the Bible, the word of, the, the word of God, greater will be the flow of the word of the Lord in your mouth. And and they can also see where you're speaking there? Yes, they so can. They, I mean, I encourage you, if you get a chance, go to where Prophet Rob is speaking. If you're a pastor watching, I've seen very few prophetic people be able to go into a church and have where you see literally um, the miraculous and you also can sense the dynamics changing in the church. So if you're a pastor, your church needs a breakthrough, or you're someone who wants to go and, he, and hear a prophetic minister, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm recommending Prophet Rob's ministry to you. Go also, go and support him. Go, go, go give support to Prophet Rob. Let's get behind this man of God. Uh, go to that website. You can connect him, all his social media accounts, YouTube, everything. But go to that website so you can connect with this anointed ministry. My friend, Prophet Rob, so thank, good. You for, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Well, that is it for this edition of ETV Interviews here on the Encounter TV Network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.